Well, good morning and welcome to Sunday School class here at Calvary Baptist Church. Uh, we're very glad that you're here and excited about what the Lord is doing at Calvary and doing in our uh, personal lives. We're going to have a word of prayer and uh, remind you about a couple of announcements. And then after that, um, Brother Brown will come and then uh, he is, uh, he'll answer some questions, do what he wants to do there. And then after he uh, uh, fields some of the questions, um, we'll uh, do some other things. We do have uh, a lot of the Sunday school classes in here this morning. I uh, hope that you're in prayer for those who are sick and afflicted. Have a lot of sickness right now. A lot of folks that aren't doing very well. A lot of folks traveling. And so pray for them also that the Lord will lift them up and protect them on these, uh, on these roads. And uh, we're excited about the, uh, the morning. So let's go ahead and we're going to have a word of prayer. And then after we have a word of prayer, we'll get right into things. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for all you do for us. Father, I'm thankful for missionaries who have a burden for people, that they might be saved. Now, Lord, so many in the world um, look at the natural man and don't look to the spiritual. I pray that you bless the Browns, as countless souls will be saved through their ministry, that you put a hedge about them and keep them safe. And, Lord, direct their paths every step of the way. Well, Father, we pray today for our other missionaries on the field. We think of those sent out of Calvary. Pray for the workmen's, Lord. I pray that you lift them up. Lord, we love them. I pray you put a hedge about them and help them. And, Father, we also pray for the Leadbetters this morning. Uh, Father, I pray that you bless their ministry, um, help them with physical needs, and uh, just bless their lives. Uh, Father, we're going to give the service to you. We ask that you uh, lead, guide, and direct in all of it. And Father, we'll thank you for what you do in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Well, um, we are glad you're here. A couple of announcements for the Sunday School program. I do have those booklets in if you're interested in a uh, growth or discipleship program. It covers uh, the booklets are put out by uh, LifeGate Ministries, and we will be starting those classes if you're interested. We'll start those classes, have them in the evenings, and we'd love for you to be able to be a part of that. Remember that this little booklet, I think, do we still have some out there of these? I think so. I think there's still a few of these out there. Um, they're at no cost. If you want to give a little donation um, in the offering plate, that would be fantastic, but they're at no cost. It's an excellent little booklet. And then fighting back, we're just about out of those, so we will be um, uh, ordering more of those as soon as possible so you can have those, and it is a wonderful, wonderful help uh, when you're talking to people about the text. Uh, don't forget that one of our adult activities would be our couples retreat. That's going to be in Nashville, Indiana. And you can see the sign up slip back in the back. We're going to have a great time. If you're interested in going, you want to book your hotel as soon as possible. And then we'll, uh, we'll give some more information as it all winds down. Well, at this time, we're going to have Brother Brown come on up and... Um, We'll have him field some questions. And um, some folks say there's no such thing as a stupid question. They're wrong. Um, there, there are some dumb questions. But even if you have a dumb one, make sure it's not too dumb. But if you have a question, make sure you let us know what your question is. Uh, Brother Brown's going to, uh, do you like Randall, Randy? Uh, Randy. Randy. Uh, and Brother Randy Brown, he's going to 
Take some time, answer those questions, and I'll have a little something from the Word of God this morning uh, to share with you if we have time for that. But I hope that you're prepared for this. Exciting to hear about the ministry in Japan. Thank you, Pastor Riker. Well, it was a blessing to be here. And funny enough, well, you're asking me about my name. I didn't know I was Randall until I went to kindergarten. <laughs> and the teacher was doing roll call going, okay, Randall Brown. And I'm looking around, five years old. That guy's name is similar to mine. Sweetheart, that's you. <laughs> um, but my name is Randy Brown. My wife, Esther, is in here. Go ahead and stand up, honey. And then two of our boys, our two oldest, uh, Dean and Elijah, and our daughter, Gwendolyn, and our two youngest, I'm assuming, are in the nursery and in their Sunday school class. So Gwendolyn and then uh, Scott and Chris. So God's blessed us with five kids. And uh, we're going to the nation of Japan. Um, it is a very needy nation. And it is, uh, it's known as the graveyard of missionaries. And in fact, the Japanese brag about that. Because they're such a hard-hearted people. And so our heart is that uh, we can be there by the end of 2023. And uh, we're actually praying to uh, serve with a national pastor. And just there's some exciting things. There's men, even though they're, they're called the graveyard of missionaries, there's good, godly men that have spent the last 60 plus years there working and toiling. And they've seen roughly 1% of the population identifies as Christian. If you look at the young people my age and younger, it's 6%. That's a big difference for one generation to the next. And God really does seem to be moving, and my heart is that we would be there, and in 20 or 30 years, Japan would be a, a 10 to 15 percent or more Christian country, which, if you've ever heard this statistic, the Muslims, at 10 percent of a population, they turn a society and make it look like them. How much more should the light of Christ transform a society? Um, does anybody have any questions? Always that awkward first question. Brother? So they're, they are roughly 99 plus percent of the Japanese population is ethnically Jap Japanese. Um, so their day-to-day -day is usually dealing with other Japanese. They don't necessarily have a, at least the majority of them, don't have a hostility towards other groups. They just, uh, it's really not something they even think about, especially in Japan. Um, so what we would try to label them, you know, how Americans, especially the, the woke culture today, would try to label racism wouldn't really apply to them because it, it doesn't even cross their mind one way or the other, for the most part. Um, generally, though, they also do have a very positive outlook for Americans um, because of the way the war ended. Um, you know, from a, a worldly perspective, they didn't deserve the mercy that America showed them in a lot of ways in rebuilding the country and everything. And so there actually is a lot of goodwill towards Americans. And if you go there, they love to talk to you. And so they're, as far as that goes, they're very welcoming of foreigners, but very much uh, closed-minded as far as how they view things in that regard. Yes, sir. Boy, that's a, that's a big question. Okay, the, um, we're looking at a city of about 700,000 uh, for planting the church initially. Uh, we're praying about serving, like I mentioned, with the national pastor in a city called Kakigawa, which has about 60,000. Um, but the way, you know, there, it's such a compact place that even when you're in a town of 60,000, that's right on the edge of a town of like, I think, close to 2 million. Um, so the rural, the line between rural and urban is very kind of blurred there in Japan. Um, but Okayama City itself, 700,000, um, which is a smaller town for Japan. 
and kind of would be for them it would be a rural backwaters kind of out of the way kind of place as far as how the normal Japanese would view it when they would compare it to Tokyo with 30 or 40 million. So Okayama uh, is on the main island of Honshu, and it kind of it runs north and south, and then around Tokyo it turns and kind of goes west. We're halfway down that western spur, um, almost exactly between uh, Hiroshima and Kyoto. So it is actually a, it is more of an out of the way part of Japan as far as for like foreigners. Um, I think at the last census there were under 300 Americans in the in the prefecture, and it was under a thousand of any European descent, out of a little oh, close to two million people. Okay, was there a hand over here? Uh, if I I need to double check the numbers on it, but I think it, like three or four of the top ten most expensive cities in the world to live are in Japan. Um, it would be pretty comparable to living New York City, uh, Los Angeles, living in some of the bigger states or cities in America. Um, and saying that you're also paying, you know, an apartment in Tokyo could be three or four hundred square feet and run you well over a thousand dollars. Okay. Back here and then we'll get you, sir. So in Okayama City itself, um, and in fact in the entire prefecture, um, all I can find is one Baptist church, church of like faith. That's not to say there aren't others. Uh, one thing I'm finding is doing research that specific in Japan outside of the country and while still learning the language is rather difficult. But as far as I can identify, there's one good church there running about 15 people out of a population of 2 million. Um, initially in Kakigawa, which is just south of Mount Fuji, we're praying about serving with uh, a man named uh, Enomoto. Um, and he is, he's running a church of about 50 to 60. And he has a reputation, a good character, and a reputation as a mentor for missionaries. And so we've got that connection through uh, some of our friends, our missionaries up in Hokkaido, and the missionary they're serving with, that's his Japanese mentor. And what is your largest challenges compared to the way we live here and the way they live there? Now you're talking about for like witnessing to them or just for living? Well, our lifestyle compared to theirs. Uh, yeah, as far as lifestyle goes, probably the biggest challenge is going to be just the space. Um, you know, she, the lady mentioned that the it's an archipelago. It's roughly the size of California, but only 11% of the land is really usable. So in, in effect, it's actually much smaller, and you have about four times the population crammed into that much smaller space. Uh, so they really just, you'll have just thousands and thousands of people just crammed into very small spaces. Um, and that really does change how you have to live. Education. Um, so that is something we're, we're really looking into for the kids. They're, they're very slow to accept you anyways as far as to like listen to the gospel. And one of the ways we do need to integrate is possibly through education. Um, our two oldest are probably too old to actually go into the public school system because by the time we're going to get there, uh, they would need to know the first thousand kanji plus have a grasp of language just to start. Uh, so we're really praying about the younger kids, whether to put them in the school there. And again, that's, some of that's going to be based on what schools are available in the area we're at. Um, we've got some friends I mentioned up in Hokkaido. Their kids, they're in a school that they respect the parents' boundaries. 
Um, whether that's something that is everywhere, I don't know. But so if they've got an issue of, you know, the, the school is going to teach them about the spirits and the Shintoism, the school has no problem with uh, allowing the kids not to be involved in those things. Um, not all schools I've heard are that, that accommodating. So it's really, it's just something we're going to have to be praying about and seeking the Lord's guidance specifically on where we're at. But that is also, that's an avenue for the Japanese to see that, hey, these people are integrating into our society because school is a very big part of their life. Uh, they view it as integral to being part of the society and parents are expected to be involved. Um, so if they see us, and I mean, that's why it's gotta be a good choice. If they see us separating over that issue, that's just gonna be kind of something standing in the way of how they would view us. And again, it's, I know you mentioned how they view foreigners. It's one thing if you're just there as a tourist or visiting how they view, it's another thing when you're going and telling them, hey, your way of life is sending you to hell. So they'll look for every little separation you're putting between you and them. Okay, and was there a hand over here? Oh, there and there. The primary is atheism. Uh, that would be roughly 60 to 70% of the population. And I always say that with an asterisk because they still follow what they call their family religions. Um, so even if they're atheist, they will still go and to do the... Uh, the native Japanese religion is Shintoism, which would basically be like ancestor worship and spirit worship or Buddhism. So they'll be atheists, but they'll still go and follow all the strictures of their religion, of their family religion, uh, as if they still believed it. And so there is that difference, like if you're atheist here versus there, they're still very religious with no belief. Okay, and back here. So when we initially serve in, in uh, Kakigawa, Lord willing, if Lord can he's open that door, that would be in an established church while we're learning the language. In Okayama, it'll be a completely fresh church plan. Um, whether the Lord opens the door to have some believers come with us, fill in the blanks, um, that's going to be at his discretion. But as far as what is there in the city, there's not much as far as gospel witness there is. Um, and you mentioned, you know, some of the other groups. I could find a few other churches there that weren't Baptist. You know, there was, a, I think, a, two or three Catholic churches. There was a JW church. There was a, a Mormon. Um, so, yeah, those other groups are there. Um, the positive is that they're, especially the cultish ones, the Japanese do actually have a hesitancy, hesitancy towards those kind of groups. Um, they've had some, and this is going back to like the 90s and 80s, they've had issues with cults. I don't know if you heard of like the, the nerve gas attack in Tokyo, the subway, stuff like that. So the more cultish a religion is, the more barriers come up. And that's a good thing and a bad thing. Um, so those groups don't have a big stronghold uh, pretty much anywhere in Japan. It's an open slate. Um, and as far as the Muslims, they, they are in, immigrating into Japan in very small numbers, but they are not, it's not anything really at this point to be concerned about. Whether the Lord, you know, or I shouldn't say whether the Lord, whether that changes in the future, um, that's up in the air. But as of right now, 
uh, the Japanese are holding them at arm's length. And we actually do have the advantage and because they do like Western things. Uh, they dress like us. Um, you know, they have basically everything about the West they love. They even have Christmas and Easter and stuff like that. They just don't have Christmas with Christ and with the Bible in it. Um, so it's really, it's not a, with the Islam, they're having to take and accept a completely different thing from what they even like. And with the Bible, it's, they like the West. They like what we have to offer. It's just getting them to see this is the most important thing. This is the only thing the West has of value to offer them. Uh, currently, there are several different versions. The primarily accepted one is uh, the Shinkyaku. Um, I'm not fully versed on all the background information. I know it's not what we would consider the best translation as far as the text underlying it. There is an effort among uh, some Baptist missionaries over there called the Lifeline translation that they are working on a uh, Texas Receptus based translation. So that's something I'm keeping a close eye on. Yes, sir. Well, um, being a little more of a, an expensive place, um, you know, it's the living expenses for a family of our size is going to be roughly probably in the five to 6,000 range, maybe a little bit more. Um, and language school can run anywhere from two to 4,000. Um, and that's a lot of prayer. We did a lot of, as much research and asking of other missionaries as we could to come up with that number. And, and it, I'll be honest, it kind of shocked me when the first time I looked at it, but um, unfortunately that's, that's the reality of Japan is it is a very expensive place um, to establish a church. Let's see, I saw another hand somewhere. Here, and over here. And was there, did you raise your hand or someone here? Oh, okay, Sam. So they have freedom of religion um, officially, but not protected in the same way we have here. Um, I know a lot of times they kind of frown on interacting in public, unless it's someone you already know. So the, the best way is really is just to make the connections one-on-one -on -one with as many people as you can. Um, something I've been thinking about is they actually, it's culturally accepted for like politicians to go to the train station and sit there and speak. Um, and they'll actually get a blow horn and they'll sit there and talk and, and hand out pamphlets to those that approach them. Um, and of course this depends on which part of Japan um, you're in, what the exact viewpoint of the people in. If you're in Kyoto, they're gonna be a lot more formal than some of the, like in Tokyo. Um, so it just depends on a little bit on where you're at and going through the proper channels and getting permission to do things like that. Um, I've heard door-to-door is not as effective um, as it used to be. They're very, they're very slow to open up to strangers especially. Um, our friend up in Hokkaido, he had a sa the same language teacher for a year and a half before he even found out if she was married, if she had kids, you know, things like that that we would find out in, in five minutes of conversation. And that's somebody he was seeing every single day. So walking up and handing someone a tract, is that getting the gospel in their hand? I think that would be, you know, that's a, a good thing to get it in their hands. But as far as whether knocking on their door and trying to engage them in conversation and they've never met you before, um, you're gonna lose what they call good feelings really quick. And they, they might nod their head, nod their head, and they'll be as polite as possible, and they will want to avoid you forever. Just that's the way their culture is. They'll be polite to your face and then avoid you. Literally, he's had people 
um, and this is over his dog, because they actually hold their dogs to the same standard. Their dogs are not allowed to talk to each other. Like if you're walking your dog and they're walking their dog, they're not allowed to talk to each other unless you're actually talking to the person. So if you're walking by, you know, you have to keep your dog away from their dog. And his dog broke that rule, and they'll walk on the other side of the street when they see him coming now. Um, so silly things like that, but it's important to them. And so it really is just got to build that one-on-one -on -one relationship. And there are opportunities. They actually, we just saw on, on Facebook, um, they, and they messaged it to my wife, they ran into some people at the beach who they were able to invite over to their home and presented the gospel to them that way and built a relationship. I mean, so God does open those doors, but it's more of a, a personal one-on-one -on -one thing than a, here's a tract, hey, have you ever heard how to go to heaven? And let's see, where was the other one? The U.S. State Department estimates 2,200 class hours um, to become fluent. And, and I'll be honest, fluent is probably at a higher level than most Japanese have. Um, at my age, you know, I'm 37, um, realistically probably looking more at the 26 to 100 to 3,000 class hours. Um, it is a, it's a difficult language to learn, uh, for English speakers especially. Uh, and it's hard to really illustrate that because it's the sentence structure is completely backwards from how we would think. Um, you would have five or six words mean the same thing. Uh, you'll have three or four different words that mean three or four different things that sound exactly the same or spelled exactly the same. You know, so if you're writing out phonetically, there's three different alphabets. You have the kanji that is written. Uh, that's like the symbol is a word. Then you have hiragana, which has almost 50 letters that they use for native uh, words. And katakana, which has another 50 letters that um, is written for foreign words. And so, you know, a lot of different things to learn and memorize. And, and that's actually all wrapped up in the culture as well. Um, the one positive thing is almost every sound that is in Japanese is also in the English language. Um, they just put them together in a little bit different ways. Uh, the only big exception would be their R sound is actually halfway between an R and an L. It's not Ra, it's Ra. I don't know if you all can catch a little, little difference there. Almost like a roll, but if you do it too much, my wife points out, you roll the R too much. But you're almost rolling it just a little bit with a little bit of an L sound in there. But other than that, every sound is the same as we make. Uh, so it's just the structure and the sheer volume of different words that mean, mean the same thing, but just are used in different contexts. Scene, did you have your hand up, young man? So they always usually dress up um, you'll see in the video, and usually I point this out after the video, but you'll see towards the end of the video there's going to be a shot of a mall. And almost all of the men are wearing a white collared shirt and dark slacks just to go out to the mall. Uh, you know, you go to a mall in America, you're going to see a lot of people dressed down. They actually dress up on a consistent basis, almost like a uniform. Um, and that's, that's not uncommon. And they actually, for the most part, they dress like we do with Western clothing. Uh, but if you want to get into like the traditional, back on our table, we have, what is it called, a happy coat? Yeah, they call it a happy coat. Um, so they do have like the traditional garb they'll occasionally wear. And that one actually was uh, a gift to my father-in-law and my three-year-old can wear it. So it's for a little toddler sized. Okay, were there any other questions? I thought I saw a hand, but... I called to preach, so that's a funny story. Um, so I was called as a uh, teenager at a Silver State Baptist Youth Camp in Colorado to go to either Germany or Japan. And I thought that God had set that aside. We had, uh, I graduated Heartland in 2015, moved back to my home church, and uh, 
was serving there, um, just basically filling the blanks we were doing. I was uh, bus director, youth pastor, college and career director. I got to do the 50 and above class, which was a lot more fun. I went into that actually terrified because here I am, 35, 36. What do I have to say to my, my elders? But that was a lot of fun. You could go really deep in that class. Um, and had, we had a new pastor coming in who had been on staff for about nine years. And God had, we'd had a plan that I was going to be his assistant pastor. I was going to be the principal of the school. And God kind of started to lay it on our hearts that no, that's not what's going to happen. And we had a visiting pastor or visiting missionary from Belgium. And he was preaching. And it was like God said, okay, you know how I called you to go to Japan as a teenager? Now's the time to go. And this was uh, September of 2020. And I, I went to my wife after that and said, honey, I think God's calling us to go to Japan as missionaries. And she's like, what are you talking about? Where'd this come from? It's like, well, you remember when I was called as a teenager to go to Japan? It's like, you never told me that. I never told you that? <laughs> We'd both been, <laughs> excuse me. <coughs> excuse me. Sorry, the allergies up here are killing me. Um, We'd only been married about 10 years at that point, you know, 10 to 11 years. It just had never come up, apparently. So, young men, if God calls you to do something, tell your, your future wife as soon as possible, even if you think God's put it on hold. Because she got a surprise. And we had already loved Japan. Um, my wife's dad was raised in Japan. Um, as we're learning more about the culture, we're actually seeing her family culture is very Japanesey. Um, and so we, we watched a lot of documentaries about Japan. And so we started praying about it for about six months. I had told uh, the new pastor coming in, Pastor Walker, um, said, hey, could you pray for God's direction? <coughs> Excuse me. God's direction. And uh, kind of laid my fleece out there. I didn't tell him um, what we were praying about specifically. I just said, pray for God's direction for where we're going to go. Um, because he was already making it apparent to me and Pastor Walker that the plans we had made was not what God was going to lead us to. And so after he was called, I sat down with him and talked to him about either going to Japan as a missionary, uh, church planting, or seeking a pastorate somewhere. And his words at that time to me was, when you said going to Japan as a missionary, he said, my heart leapt. And so this was uh, March of 2021. And we prayed about it for another month, going into our missions conference in April. And God really was already laying it out because Pastor Walker had the, uh, the keynote ske speaker already scheduled. Excuse me. And uh, that was uh, Brother David Harris with BIMI. He's the Far East director and he spent over 20 years in Japan as a missionary. And that was our keynote speaker at the conference. And... Um, I'm drawing a blank on your name. What was your name again? Was that? Yeah, Miss Kay. She was back there talking to me. And apparently, you're, you're the first person that had actually brought up Brother Morgan. Um, he was at our conference in April, and uh, he's going to Japan as a missionary as well. Um, they're just about to finish. They're about a year ahead of us. And so we're, here we are. We have the keynote speakers going to Japan one of the uh, missionaries at the conference is going to Japan. And the first night, uh, the Morgans were downstairs teaching the kids and Brother Harris is up, up in the pulpit and he starts laying out all the bad things about Japan, how hard the language is, how stubborn the people are, um, how hard hearted they are and all down the list. And he says, don't you tell those missionaries downstairs, you'll discourage them. And here I am thinking, Brother Harris, you have no idea who's in the audience. I've been praying for six months about going to Japan. What about me? Am I going to get discouraged? <laughs> and so I went up and talked to him afterwards. And throughout that whole week, um, you know, God had, we had already really solidified it in my heart. And just he kept telling my wife over and over again, Japan, 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 Japan. Um, and that Sunday, you know, God made it very apparent. We went down. And, you know, of course, I turned my wife and said, we need to go down. And she, she knew what I was talking about. And we surrendered, had a meeting with Pastor Walker after that, that Sunday morning service. And he said, if you came in here and told me 
anything but missions to Japan, I tell you, you're wrong. That's how, how much his heart was settled on it. And so we got to present to the church that night and just the way the church got 100% behind us. Um, it, was, it was just God's hand was all over it. And that's kind of how God called us to go to Japan. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. We have not. We had a trip planned for our uh, 10th anniversary of our, and uh, that was right when COVID hit. Uh, we were praying about a survey trip at the beginning of September, um, which at this point, the way things are going, it, it's probably going to be God's hand if we can get in. Uh, they've been, they just opened up at the beginning of June for um, uh, tour groups. So you can only get in if you go with the tour group and you have to get the visa and everything. Um, normally, Japan, is, before COVID, was very open. As Americans, you just get your plane ticket, you arrive there, and you get the tourist stamp for 90 days. They have not been... Uh, they've been very fearful over COVID, more so than most countries. And so they are talking about reopening for regular tourists. Uh, they say by autumn, but that's always kind of up in the air. And then, of course, I was talking to another gentleman. Of, uh, their prime, former prime minister was just assassinated right before an election on the 11th. Well, they had said they were going to look at reopening after that election. And so that's, his, his assassination has kind of thrown a lot of things into chaos um, with all that. So big question mark there, but we're praying and, and working towards getting there in September. Was there another hand? Yes, sir. Um, they're fairly reasonable once you work through the process, but they're also very strict that you have to work through the process. Um, and a lot of it's paperwork. So currently, uh, if we were going to be going there for, like, permanently able to go, you know, we'd raise our sport, we're, we're ready to go. Um, it would be a permanent religious visa, uh, typically, you have to have a sponsor in the country. Um, if you don't, I think there's a lot more loopholes you have to jump through. Um, and it usually takes about a, five days to a month. And once you get it, you're basically, you're set. And, you know, they don't check up on you, things like that. It's just very easy, once you get it, to get there. Um, but again, with COVID, they've been open and closed, open and closed. I think the first time they opened was around November of 21. They opened up for about a month, and then I think the Delta variant hit, and then they shut right back down, and then they finally opened up uh, permanently for those kind of visas in, I think it was February or March. Um, they really was just going through their process and doing everything, jumping through all the hoops that they want you to jump through. Uh, but once you get it, and this is where I say they're a little more reasonable than, than most, um, they mail it to you, you have 30 days to get in, but they will post date it, and they actually will check this, how long it's estimated to get to you. And, of course, they're shipping this, I think, sometimes from Japan. They estimate how long it's going to get to you and then post date it to that day. So you have 30 days from when they expect you to receive the, the visa. Um, whereas I think the U.S. government just go... Sorry, it's when, whenever you get it, you have 30 days from when we issue it and hope you get it in time. Um, but again, they're very, even more particular than the U.S. government on dotting your I's and crossing your T's. But once you do, they're fairly reasonable to work with. Okay, was there another hand? Oh, young man. Well, sushi is the big one. Um, one of the weirder ones is, uh, it's called natto. It's fermented soybeans, they eat it for breakfast. And it looks like it's, it's like beans in slime. It's not bad, I've actually tried it. Uh, my wife wouldn't, did you try it or did you? Okay, I actually tried it, it's not bad. 
but they'll put that on rice and then the beans with the slime and uh, that's a common breakfast over there but that's one of the words what was that alarm Uh, First Bible Baptist of Bakersfield, California. So that's uh, my home church that I was uh, started there when I was 12, right after I got saved. Okay, that was a quick, easy one. Is there any more? Are we good? One last one. So um, there was a missionary to China, uh, Hudson Taylor, um, who was very, very effective. This was in the 1800s. And what he said was, um, in all things, and I'm paraphrasing, of course, but in all things not sinful, Chinese. And that's my heart for the day. In all things not sinful, Japanese. And the reason I say this is because if I go there and try to make them Americans, it's not going to go anywhere. Um, You know, that is a pitfall that, unfortunately, a lot of missionaries have tried. They go to a place and they try to make them like us instead of making them like Christ. And so, even in little ways, you know, you have to learn how to pronounce words the way they pronounce it because that's the correct way. Uh, But any stumbling block I can eliminate by being like them, then I'll do that. But again, not sinful. I'm not going to participate in their religious practices. And there's going to need to be a lot of discernment there because their religion impacts every, almost every aspect of their culture. So um, I'm going to have to have some wisdom in exactly where I draw that line and where the Lord would lead me to that. Pastor? Very informative. I pray that you go back and ask you go back and check that table out. Young people will stay out here. The Chil- Mrs. LeSure's Children's Church group will be in the auditorium. Parents, if you could make sure your children take that necessary trip. We don't like folks going in and out of the auditorium during the preaching. And so uh, then we'll get right into the service here in just uh, just a few minutes. Thank you for being here this morning. You are dismissed.